Hello, beautiful human. I'm Zach. That's Dan. And we welcome to the studio, Peter McPoley. Yo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. You're very <laughs> fascinating to me. Oh, uh, thank you. Okay. For, for a couple different reasons. Uh, somebody who gives super rock star, who gives, leaves it all on stage, literally, physically. You have quite the little crew that you travel with. Yeah. I mean, today we're kind of. Pack and heavy. Yeah, you know, you're you're rolling decently deep. Yeah, I thought so. It's more than usual. Yeah, more than usual. Um, but yeah, everyone was kind of in town, so it was just a big field trip to the Amazon studio. I like that. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, you rock out hard, yet you still have hair and makeup. Yeah, again, not not always have hair and makeup. <laughs> I did this one. I did like the MTV interview this uh -huh. one time or whatever, and I was running late off the bat and. The subway had gotten shut down. It was the one the big thing happened in Union Square, and I, the Twitch streamer had like oh, done yeah. all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was running late to the thing, and I had to sprint like fifteen blocks across Times Square, and I got to the thing, and my manager was waiting for me, and I was like dripping in sweat <laughs> before it was going on the live <laughs> interview. And I think Julie was telling me that, that he has PTSD now, so now I have to have makeup. But got it. Me as a person. It's not, not me. Like, it's really not. I have concealer on right now. You look great. Dude, it does not, like, without the under eye bags, I don't feel like Peter. It doesn't feel like me. Yeah, can know? I ask, like, what happened to your leg? I was jumping. I was going to jump in the pit every night for this one song in the set. And in Toronto, we had jumped in, and I kind of bruised my left heel. Uh-huh. And then in Chicago, I jumped in. And I was off balance from the left heel, and I jumped once, twice, three, and I rolled my right foot, and it broke my fifth metatarsal. Oh, so, Jesus. And you've been performing on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes for a great photo. I was kind of psyched. We just bedazzled the boot a couple nights ago. No, it looks good. <laughs> yeah. And it gives what you give on stage. Yeah, it kind of, it, it's a nice metaphor for everything. And when the light hits it just right, and if I spin around really fast, it has a really nice effect on it. Sick. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been trying to figure out, as I listen to all your music, is the person that we listen to today that's uh, in this album, uh, which is called Piggy, you describe this whole thing as like a second puberty, correct? Sure, yeah. But is the Peter we're talking to today the same Peter that gave us Romeo and Juliet, or are we talking to somebody totally different? No, I think so. I think, I think I'm always... The Peter that gave you Romeo and Juliet. It, I think Piggy was kind of the adventure off, but it's now coming back to it. I I had gotten really sad for a while, so I feel like that was that's the Piggy era. That's just me angry and sad for a bit. But at my core and who I am, I always want to be the like Romeo and Juliet guy. I don't know. It means a lot to me, and that whole time means a lot. So. Well, th correct me if I'm wrong. Like that's the song that essentially changes your life, or at least gets you signed to Columbia. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And the album we're getting today, it, even compounded with the performances, like you open for Twenty One Pilots. Correct. Yeah. There's a different Peter that's on stage during your performances with Twenty One Pilots than gave us Romeo and Juliet. Absolutely, but it's also just a different, different person in general when it's on the stage. Like it's kind of this switch that goes off, and then. It's like who I'm talking to you right now as is not me on stage. I don't I don't exist up there. It's like this really six. I was saying to it, I, I was I'm broken and my left heel's bruised and I was sick for a day. But there's like something that happens on the stage where it's just I I literally could do it every single day and I would just be gushing blood and I would be so content. It's so fun up there. Like I don't know how to explain it, but it's really. I'm a, I really like the version of myself up there. Why do you need to bleed to put on a good show? I, no, I really don't, but I can't help it. I, <laughs> last night I hit it on the guitar string. Yeah, the photo's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, and you tweeted it, proof. Yeah. Wild. Yeah, we did that again last night, and I don't know. I really don't. I think it, the adrenaline shuts off my, like, pain receptor. And so I was kind of playing with it for a while. I used to do the cymbal punch yeah. every night. And it was it became like you're just testing the limits of the adrenal gland. Um, and the limit can be pushed further, farther. So I don't know. But where's the line between performance and masochist? I don't know. I'm finding that I'm a bit of a masochist up there. <laughs> Deaf. But, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not a masochist. Like, it's not me. Um, 
But yeah, I don't know. I think I, I But think, is this new version of you attached to Piggy? Yeah, I mean I'm I'm attached to it. Uh, but I don't know. I mean it, there's a line of masochism that I think is always in the performance and I think I'm just trying to push it as far as possible. I think it's just interesting to me. It's wild. Yeah. It's wild yeah. to watch, but also to hear the sonic differences between what we got earlier on and what we're getting even in this album. Yeah. It just sounds like a lot of compounding life changes. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot of... I mean, I think anyone... Everyone that's coming off of TikTok right now, I feel like all these TikTok artists are all going through the exact same thing, you know? Everyone kind of got signed off of, like, a single song, this totally. single moment, they have this sound. And everyone had the exact same childhood dream, and all of them achieved it, and now they're dealing with the repercussions of achieving their childhood dream, you know? But I think a version of the childhood dream. I think most mm -hmm. people, and I'll make the case all day, between 2019 and today, we've seen more one-hit wonders than we've seen in a long time. Absolutely. And I, I, I'll be an asshole right now. I can make the case that your label has <laughs> fueled that fire like Bro, nobody's they business. They love the one-hit wonder. They love it. I, yeah. It's a genius. It works. Yeah. Love you all with every fiber of my being, but like... It's been wild what we've seen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's tough, too. It's tough on the kids like me. It, you're 20 years old. I wrote Romeo and Juliet. I learned to produce writing that song. Like, before Romeo and Juliet, I did not ha know how to produce. And so I watched a bunch of YouTube tutorials. I was working at Domino's. I quit Domino's. I was like, fuck this job. I'm going to go produce a song, and I'm going to put it up on TikTok. And so I learned to produce for Romeo and Juliet. And then that song got me signed and it got me like, I moved out off of that. And so then it's like this big, huge, am I allowed to curse? Yes. It's this huge mind fuck. Cause totally. you're, I was 20 years old and like all of a sudden overnight, essentially, even though I've been working for it since you're like 14 years old, you're learning to play the guitar overnight. All of a sudden, every single dream that you've ever had just comes true. And then after the first tour, I remember standing on the stage. I had this like specific vision when I was 14. I had this dream where I was at a five seconds of summer concert <laughs> and Luke Hemmings couldn't play the guitar anymore. And they asked me up on stage and I got up and I played the guitar for everyone in the audience. And that, I, that was one of the only song I knew it was Amnesia by Five Seconds of Summer. Classic. Right? But it was such a specific vision and I held it with me for so long. I was like, one day I'll fulfill this night, you know? And so after the first tour, I fulfilled it. Like, I remember standing on the stage and I got like chills. I was like, I'm Luke Hemmings right now. Like, I'm <laughs> playing the guitar. And I, I like looked out at all these people. And then after that, like the show ends and you're like, what the hell else am I supposed to do now? You yeah, know, like, what's, what's next? I got it. Like, I was 14 to 21. I was everything I had ever wanted. How many songs were you sitting on when Romeo and Juliet breaks? Because, like, obviously you wrote Lady Bird, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. song about Lyndon B. Johnson's wife yeah. planting flowers in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Sick. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what the reason is behind that. I can't explain well, it's that. It's giving, like, somebody who just takes good stories and makes songs out of it. I, I can guess. make the same case around Piggy, right? It's about Lord of the Flies. A little bit, yeah. A little bit? That was kind of a scapegoat. I kind of just threw that out. <laughs> really? To be honest, yeah. You are like, what did I learn in fucking middle school yeah. that I could just distract people with? Like, I like Lord of the Flies, but it's not, I'm not like, I'm going to write the whole album about <laughs> Lord of the Flies, Piggy. Although that's cool. No, I mean, yeah. I, I've sitting on a lot of songs, and I'm still sitting on a lot of songs. Um, but Piggy, I, I've been on this big, I used to write, like, constantly. And then before Piggy, I, I hadn't written in forever so it's kind of that's the culmination of Wait, like so, okay you wrote before you wrote constantly before romeo and juliet no, yeah yeah i would write i have I, mean, I have so many songs that i just have not put out but not produce like you didn't know how to produce them at the time i didn't know how to produce no so then after the success of romeo and juliet do you just stop no no i kept writing i kept i was so like i kept writing until when my parents got divorced the switch went off and they got divorced right when i signed so it was like two weeks leading up until it was like I got signed and my mom moved out a week later and there was this weird like I think I valued the family structure really highly like yeah. I love the family structure I love that I ate it up but yeah after they got divorced and I like had this I signed and everything and everything started changing I like stopped writing all of a sudden and it was like this 
big, long stretch of writing no songs. Uh, well, what about the family structure did you value? Sorry. Well, I think it was because, like, if everything... My whole life, I, was, I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be, like, I, it's your childhood dream, right? And my mom had helped me so much in it. And I think along the whole time, I was thinking, like, all right, I'm doing this for them. I'm doing this for, like, the family. And it was this, I kept visualizing in my mind, like, when I got signed, if I got signed, that there would be this big, like, celebration and stuff. I don't know. You know, like, it was like a payoff for all the hard work that my mom had done. Like, she had driven us across the country, like, so many fucking times. And we took all these different places and played really shitty songs. Yeah, and I think just the payoff, like, I finally did it. And then it, poof, and it, you know, blew into a million pieces, the whole family structure. And it felt like, I don't know, it was just weird. It was a weird uh, finality to it all. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. Yeah. And by the way, like I can make the case throughout uh, life, you'll visualize these situations in these moments and you'll get a portion of it, but it won't be exactly how you wanted it. Yeah. Yeah. It's turning out that way. But you know what? You still get some of it and you got to make the best of it. Oh no, dude, I'm having the best time. And, I'm and having a great time. See, yeah. like and with big wins come some sort of losses. Like nothing is always going to be great. Yeah. I like, I like could tell you a trillion stories. You know, it's like, it's very accurate. But I think there is sil silver lining, though. Your parents raised a cool kid. <laughs> Thank you. Did a good job. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I don't know, they could have gotten divorced much earlier on in your life, and it would have been a lot more traumatizing, and you may never have been where you're at today. Absolutely. I yeah. mean that. Like, yeah. tens of millions of kids suffer from real, split, toxic, abusive households, and it happens in very formative years of their life. Very formative. Between five to, like, 14 years old. And like a real like divorce could be ugly. Yeah. It could be abusive. It could be filled with court dates. It could be filled with having to turn kids against parents. It could be some of the wo worst disgusting things yeah. you've ever seen. So there is silver lining to it. I genuinely believe that because at the end of the day, like your parents did a lot for you. Yeah. No, I, th I think they were, I th I, I'm eternally grateful. And I think it was meant to, I do think that there was some aspect of it happened at like the perfect time. It happened yeah. right at the end. I don't know why we had to start on such a downer topic. I mean, ran just. Yeah. I had shit on my brain, you know. Welcome to the Zach Sang Show. All right, thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, thank thanks. You. Yeah. Does your parents' divorce lead to the change in sound? Um, because you mentioned you were sad when you entered this piggy era. Yeah, not necessarily. I think I was sad because I wasn't writing. Like I just missed writing. Mm -hmm. I was such. I was so bummed out. But um, no. I mean, I think I think the change in sound happens when you right when you get signed. You like start working with producers and all this stuff and all of a sudden everything's kind of like you're going from writing in your bedroom to now writing with people and it becomes this profession and so um the change in sound was kind of I was just trying to go back to a only me sound I was trying to go back to something that only I can do in my bedroom mm. so um it was just like a quiet revolution uh, revolution uh rebellion of against the producer and the, the whole scene. So how many sessions do you end up like, because we do get records between Romeo and Juliet and Piggy, not, but not really like, so how many songs were you like creating with other producers that will never see the light of day? Not a lot with other producers. I fight, I fight going in with a producer often. Um, but I, I write a lot on my own. I mean, there's, there's a lot. There's at least a, maybe close to 100 or something like I feel like I have a shit ton of songs so for the 11 songs that are on Piggy do you write new or do you pull from older stuff or just stuff that's been sitting all new it's all new Piggy's all new uh, Find, Find Me Out is not new Find Me Out was an old song um, but the rest of it is all new stuff why did that song fit the story you were telling it was the first song I had written um, with a band it was the first song that I had written and I think Piggy, I was trying to go back to, like, old me. I was trying to do right in your bedroom stuff. And I had a band in high school that is, like, the most formative time of my life. And it was the first song that we had written and played with the drums. And, like, the first time I heard that you, like, get the full body chills. And it's it was so magical. And I I had always kind of promised myself that I, I would want it on my first album. And so I went back to Texas, where I'd grown up, and I recorded it with the original band and put it on the album and that's sick yeah it was a really special 
it was that's it was just for me. It was indulgent. I, it was just special. Full circle, but a way to perfectly match what you used to do. Yeah, yeah, it was sweet. It was very sweet, and it's it's fun live. That's the one I I bleed in that one every night. I guess so. Do you know you're bleeding when it's happening? Yeah, I mean, last night I could feel it on the pick. It started getting slippery and <laughs> gross, and then oh. it was nasty. Um, but it's no, it's odd because it's not a, it's not painful. It just it just happens. So you're making music with this th- this band in Texas before you start figuring out how to produce. Mm. Is there anything that you carried over with you from that live understanding that you use in production or use with Romeo and Juliet, or did you just really learn from nothing? I mean, I, yeah, I guess I learned from nothing. Um, I fight a click track quite a lot. I I can't stand playing to a click. Um, and I really like wrapping cables because we used to like do outdoor gigs and stuff. And so I like, I love to wrap a cable <laughs> and this is the first tour. They won't let me touch a cable on it now. So I'm off that job, but I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I got, I got over it fast, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I carried over performance. I can play the guitar a little bit better than I, I would have if I wasn't in the band and, um, yeah, but wrapping cables, I really miss that. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. 39 minutes and 44 seconds is the runtime of the album. She moves. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Was that strategic? No, I mean, it was, it was kind of like pulling teeth. I mean, I, I had, I was scraping at some songs there and. But if it's like pulling teeth, why don't you go back to what you've been sitting on? Cause it wasn't, it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right time. And I think I, I really wanted something to exist to look back on that I, I could do. I think I'm, I was really scared of becoming a genre artist. I'm really, I still am. I, I really don't want to be like, um, a genre, you know, I don't want to be listen to alternative music, listen to this, listen yeah. to folk music. I mean, my, and like, I want to, I want it to just be theater music, you know? And so I think this was my attempt at trying to give some sort of contrast so that I can go back to the old stuff. I get it give people a world. So are you watching the other people who got signed off of a single and figuring out where they've gone wrong? I mean, yeah, maybe not where they've gone wrong, but I'm definitely like knowing where I don't want to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You just said what I said in a better way. Ex- yeah. yeah. <laughs> but genre, yeah, genre artists, I'm, I'm terrified of a genre artist, you know? Did you feel like you were falling into the folk music category? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. I, that's not, it's not me. And I'd stopped listening to folk so intently so after like 18, um, but yeah, it's a scary thing. It's but a scary thing. You say it's not you, but is it still not a part of you? Cause that's, that... It's a part of me. It's a part of me, but it's it's like not... It's like I was I was a dumb kid when I was a folk music guy, you know? I was essentially 18. I was 17. You know nothing then, you know? Like, it's just, you're not a real person yet. And so I, I am part of that, but it's it's like if that was just me... In my mind, I would just be eternally 17, and that's unfair. I get that. Yeah. Yeah, your music needs to meet you where you're at. Exactly. I do appreciate it. I'm always a lyrics guy, so it's always there. I can make the case that the greatest songwriters in the world are folk writers to begin with, and you can dress up a good folk song in pretty much any fucking clothes. It can go anywhere. Uh, Shout out Skylar Gray all day. Yeah. Starts as a folk artist, is the only artist to have written for Dr. Dre, Eminem, and Celine Dion. Like, all from the same fucking roots that make up good storytelling. Yeah. So you can dress that shit up however you want. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's always storytelling. It really is a, kind of the end all be all. By the way, all of Peter's music is waiting for you. It's sitting on Amazon Music. There's going to be a link in the description below. What are you thinking? Are you still working with uh, Peter McPullen and the Haps, or are those guys, you guys all go your separate ways? <laughs> that's the band. I mean, they recorded on the album. So that's the band you're working with. That's the band. No, they did one song on the album. Why uh, aren't they on the road with you? I, I, I <laughs> yeah. not good enough no they are good enough and it's objectively like we have like we when we played together it was as though we had not missed a beat so how sick is that it's so special I think it is so special and we are so close that I just didn't want to like it, Peter McPolin and then Peter McPolin, you know, is a different thing. And I think when it started getting all into business and stuff, it was just, it was too much to conjoin the two. And I really didn't want to ruin a relationship. I, like, it's almost, I wanted it to be the end of the road so that we could preserve what we had and not 
running into the ground on the possibility. But, I get that. But I think about them a lot. I mean, it was a hard decision that kept me up a lot. And it has to be because like in on one side, right? Like you are preserving something that's great and special, but also on the flip side, you may never find that musicianship and connectivity ever again. I definitely won't. Like you could be on stage with the best musicians in the world and just because y'all don't click, y'all don't click. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, no, the band is phenomenal. The band that I have, I love them and they're phenomenal. Um, it's different though. But yeah, I mean, no one, no one gets you like the first guy that you play guitar. Like we learned, me and my friend Landon, we learned to play guitar together yeah. and we would sing together and post videos and like it was just. Some of the greatest bands in history have been playing together for a very long time. Yeah. Label mate, Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. You know? Most of those people have been playing together since they were fucking children. Yeah. Yeah. I think about this a lot. Thanks for making me second guess it now. I don't want to be thinking about this all the way home. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's really hard because you don't want to mix business with pleasure. Exactly. Also known as shitting where you eat. Exactly. But it takes a certain level of maturity and understanding of your role in the larger machine for that to work, right? And it doesn't all fall on you. Yeah. I, I tell myself that if it was to happen when it was time, it would just be t like I would know it's time. Yeah, so, fuck yeah. Yeah. Keep with that. Yeah. Yeah, I miss them. Special. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can we talk about Turn off the noise. Sure. Uh, does that song only come after shutting everything out? Yeah, turn off the noise is where I broke my foot in the set and turn off the noise. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think that one I was kind of proud of. I was like, I'm I'm really anti writing a chorus and I'm anti writing a bridge. I think just because I came from like folk. I don't know. I have a big piss off with like writing a chorus, and so I was kind of proud that I. I managed to do kind of a clubby like dance track and it's really special to me. I don't know. I, I, I wrote that just to impress myself, I think, or just to <laughs> like um, tell myself to stop being pretentious about it. And so, yeah. Is there, I mean, do you have like a, a, a strategy that you kind of apply to every song in term, or at least a process? It, there's definitely a similar process. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times it'll start with a single lyric. Like I'll have a favorite lyric. And then I'll write the song around it. Um, like the song Dog, I was sitting on the lyric, the damn fucking dog bit too hard this time. And I thought that that was so, like, bit too hard. That it's just, it tells a whole story in it and it, it leads up. I, it was so fucking potent to me. Um, and so I wrote a whole song just to support that lyric. Who's the dog? Um, or what is the dog? Yeah, I guess I was the dog in theory. I'm the dog a little bit. It was kind of me versus me, man versus man. Um, but yeah, it's it's my, it's like me fighting myself on having a hard time for so long. And I was just, damn fucking dog crying wakes me up, makes me mean. Damn fucking dog drool dripping off of his snout. It's just, I was kind of making fun of myself, I guess. And yeah, I don't know. I try not to get into it too much. Do you, th does the meaning of these songs or the reason why these songs exist present itself before, after, or during the process? Uh, different for each one. It's different for each one. Some of them is before. Um, some of the ones, like Piggy, a lot of them is after because it was just writing really fast. Did you feel like you needed to write it fast? Yeah. Why? Yeah, it felt... Because I, I hadn't done anything. Like, I hadn't really been writing. And I had just been kind of sitting on my ass for a while. And so I think I just, I came off 21 Pilots tour and I had all this momentum from tour. And so I went on a road trip after that, like left. And I was like, I need to, I just, I don't know. And my gut, I follow my gut. I only listen to my gut. And my gut was like, you got to produce an album by yourself now. And I was like, okay, gut, sure. Sounds good. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the question was. But. By the way, now we have Piggy. It's waiting for you. It's all yeah. on Amazon Music. Link in the description below. Who produced Slow Down? Did you do that with, like, producers? Or you <clears throat> yeah, I'd, I had a producer. Um, his name was Steve Rush. Yeah. I'm sure you like the music, but how do you feel about it now looking back after making Piggy? I like it. I love it. I mean, it's... I love it more now than before Piggy because I got... Piggy, you get to, like, express more, yeah. you know? Like, Slow Down before Piggy, I was like... I can do more. I can do something else, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I did Piggy, and I'm like, oh, I appreciate where I came from. Um, yeah, but I like it. I just wanted to do something different. Do you ever think about what your fans want from you, or is that like, not like an, 
afterthought, but do you have to do what's better for you first? Because if you take the fan base you made off Romeo and Juliet, they probably are not expecting Piggy from you. No, no, but I think about what they want constantly. Like, every decision I make, I think. They're really fucking awesome. Like, they're, it, it's, the best part of the night is, like, I'll finish in the green room, and I'll go outside, and there's, like, however many people waiting. And you get to, like, it's so fulfilling. Maybe it's indulgent, but it's so fulfilling to, like, talk to someone, and they appreciate your art, like, to create the art, to do it on the stage, and then they're standing there with, like, the merch on, and they tell you what they loved about it. It's so fulfilling. It's, like, I, I don't know. It just makes me feel... That's the most often... Like, I feel like a true artist there. You know, I don't feel what? like a anything. I don't feel imposter syndrome because it's so much love in it. I don't know. Um, and it's I, direct. Like, it's face-to-face. -face. You're yeah. seeing it. You're feeling it. Like, you're hearing from somebody who's truly been changed and understands what you make. Yeah, it's really... I can't like understate how important that part of the night is to me. I, I do. I understand that. Like you use the word indulgent. I go back and forth. Like, is it validating that allows me to keep going when you meet somebody who loves what you do? Or do you love meeting them? And is it considered in, like, is it like egotistical? Is it right? Like, right. Like I'm just witnessing somebody who's telling me how great I am when the reality is like people exist like yourself or you make art in this bubble, no matter how big the bubble is. And like, you really don't necessarily know, like, if it's working or not. I mean, yeah, you sell out shows. That's a good s sense of validation. You see comments and shit. You see numbers are just numbers. Yeah. Something's different when it's a human being in front of you, talking to you, staring you in the face. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so, it's like... You know what you're doing it for. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's so special. I, I mean, yeah, every decision I make is, I, like, think, what would they think? Because it is. It's all. It's for them. It's all for them, you know? If... If I'm just making art for myself, I'm I'm not going to... Uh, it's for me. But there is a cross. Like, there's a place where it comes together, where you can make art for you, but in, in return, it, the ripple effect means it's for everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but art for me, like, if I'm making pure art for me, I'm making 45-minute ambient music <laughs> with, like, weird <laughs> visuals behind it. Is I'm that just, really what you want to make? No, but it's funny to say. <laughs> um, I like ambient, but no. Um, yeah, I mean, I make it for me, and I think, how is this going to help someone... Is this gonna like ruin me in their eyes? Is it gonna? Is it too much of just me? Is it? There is a balance. There's a balance. By uh, the way, you give Burlington, Vermont, hippie more than you give somebody who grew up in Texas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been back in back up east now for. Yeah, are you in Brooklyn now? I'm in Brooklyn. Oh, it's not Burlington, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I was never really Burlington though. But I was. Where were you? I, I was Burlington, but I was only there till I was seven, yeah. so it doesn't count. You were still raised as a, uh, seven years is formidable years. Oh, yeah. No, no. I was the outsider. Like, I, I did not feel, because everyone had family in Texas, too, and uh. we were so isolated. There was, I didn't see my grandparents for, like, years and stuff. I didn't see the rest of the family, so. Why'd they, why'd your family go to Texas? It was like, my, I think my parents just liked moving. They moved a lot. <laughs> and so I think when things would get boring, I guess, they would just both move. So they had gone to like Arizona and Vermont and New Jersey and oh, yeah. Texas and we just stayed in Texas because it was cheap for a very long time. Yeah. And then when I graduated, uh, they moved up to Rhode Island and we really had no reason of being in Rhode Island. Sick. But I met my photographer in Rhode Island because of that move. I was there for like six months and we happened to meet off of the internet and now he's done every album art and taken every photo of me since then. So All the moves needed to happen. It's always, it's, it's always meant to be. Well, okay. Speaking of that, there's a whiteboard in the album cover and we did some searching. <laughs> there seems to be title tracks behind you, right? On the whiteboard. Yeah. Angel numbers. Yeah. Is that a song? Yeah. That was one of the first ones I did uh, for the album. It didn't make it. Why? Um, it was kind of weird. It was kind of weird, and I didn't think it <laughs> added anything. Do you believe in the universe like that? Uh, and angels and, sending you signs? And angel numbers? You know what? 333? I don't believe in necessarily angel numbers so specifically, but I do believe in in an aspect of universal pull. I really do. Mm -hmm. I think everyone does at least a little bit. No one's just so cold that they have no passion. I don't know. Um, yeah, I do a little bit, but... I'm not an angel numbers guy. It, the the song just repeats, heart, eyes, angel numbers, time of death, angel numbers, heart. It like repeats it over and over. 
And it's this really hard, cool, like, I don't know. It was a cool song. It was really cool. I'll show it to you. I'll, I'll, you, know, you have to let me know what you think. What about Guppy? Is that one of the songs? Yeah, that was a song too. That was, I worked on that for a long time. That kind of put me behind schedule because I was trying to finish that song. And it just was not meant to be. It was shit, but it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. St. Peter? St. Peter, we're playing at the live show. We're playing live. That's an old song. Um, I wrote that about the song that I played with the band, about Find Me Out. I wrote St. Peter about my love for that song. So That's they the, weird. They have the same chorus. Wait, you wrote a song about your love for another song you yeah. did? Yeah, I mean, kind of. I mean, yeah, I wrote it for it. It's got lyrics that are more like Catholicism stuff, but like... You grew up Catholic? Yeah, yeah. Every day or every Sunday for until I was 18. Yeah, I went to church every day for a long time. Yeah. I was an altar boy. Damn. Yeah. That must have been fun. What's your relationship with the church now? I love the art. I love... Uh, you like the stained glass <laughs> windows? Dude, are you kidding me? <laughs> There's something so special about like... Like when you're waist high for majority of your memories in the church. It's like true. I remember... Like, I remember my dad's watch because it was always on the pew. I remember, like, the teeth marks on the pew. I remember the stained <laughs> glass. Like, every, all my memories are, like, waist high. So I have this really genuine appreciation for everything at the waist, I guess. So, like, I think, I think about everything, like, the hands and stuff. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I appreciate it because I was there. It, it's like your thinking time. I would just go to church on Sundays and I would just tune out and just think for an hour. And I just like stare up and just, you can't be on your phone. You couldn't do it. It was, it was, I kind of missed the meditative aspect of it. But I, l I like that. Yeah. It was definitely really, not what church was going for. No, I definitely just sit there definitely, and not listen. No, yeah. if they asked me, yeah, they wouldn't have been happy with my, but I did, I, it was successful for me. Like it was fulfilling. Yeah. yeah Cause you got a chance to just shut off the rest of the world yeah, and sit up you. It was great. Sick. Yeah. It was great. You get dialed in on the, the, when you kneel, stand, sit. That's yeah, great. You just know. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good time. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Piggy's waiting for you. There's a link in the description below. What story are you telling with this album, Top to Bottom? Is there one story? No. No, I mean, I, there's one story for me, but I think for everyone, it's every song has something else to offer. It really does. I think there's a lot of like, it's a lot of self-analysis, and I think there's also a lot of societal uh, analysis, but it's also just fun. It's a fun difference. If you listen to the old music and then you go and listen to Piggy, it's fun to be like, oh, we can do other things, you know? That's, I think... What's the one story for you, though? I don't know. I'm really proud of it. I think I... I th like, in making it, the meanings of each song changes because it's just as it... as you, Like, now it means something different to me than it did a year ago. Totally. But I'm, like... I'm really proud that I did it. Like, I've always wanted to be able to do this big single pro I feel like every artist, you know, it's like it's close to a magnum opus, but it's not even close to it. It's just, it's so special to be able to complete a full project and it's like on your own. And I got up every single day and I was at the computer and just like drowning in it. And it was so, you know, like, uh, it kind of made me go a little crazy and I loved it. Like it was so awesome. But you proved to yourself that you can do it on your own again. Exactly. Exactly. And I needed that. So now that I proved to myself that I can do it on my own, now I'm going to go back in the studio with producers. Yeah. You'll have a studio <laughs> sessions yeah, with exactly. exclusively 15 yes. plus people. Exactly. Yeah. It's only. You want to be in sessions where you can't even memorize everybody's name. I don't want to know anyone's name and I don't want to touch any lyric. Don't I want to fucking look at me. It's written for me. It's <laughs> sung for me. I want that. That's my next, next album. Damn. Yeah. I appreciate you, Peter McBoland. Thank you, Zach Sang. Come and uh, hang out again as you release music. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Our couch is always here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Literally anytime. Final thoughts? The last question I had is, uh, what's the meaning behind blue and why do people like Rhett and Link, Mr. Beast, and Emma Chamberlain pop up in the music video? Oh, T. <laughs> oh, good question. Um, blue is, I mean, there's a song Slow Down and then there's Blue. It was one of the first ones I did too for the album. It's Don't Slow Down. I was like just writing off my previous message to the fans, um, which was kind of nice. And yeah, I mean, Mr. Beast, who else? Emma. Emma and Chamberlain's in there, Rhett and Link. Rhett it might and be Link. Some, like Fortnite. It's just my like YouTube recommend. It's just what I'm watching, <laughs> dude. And I just like the way they all looked on the screen. I liked being in good company. I was just watching them. I you fucking love them. You have Minecraft uh, yeah, curtains in your room. I fucking love Minecraft. You man. also have a, 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 a crucifix. Uh, yeah, I'm telling you, dude. It's I love the art. 
<laughs> I love the art and I love Minecraft. It really boiled me down. And it's just like Catholic art and Minecraft. That's all there is to me. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, so are they in the music video or is it just no, the, look. Oh. So like he's Oh, it's just their videos. Yeah, it's their videos. Yeah, he's on photo booth and everybody else is just doing their videos around him. I like that. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of fun. I think often like I'm a big Emma Chamberlain fan. And so I just think like if I ever met her, would I tell her about that video? And I don't think I would. I think that that's it. Like, it's embarrassing to me now, is what I'm saying. <laughs> it's it. embarrassing to me. We're going to clip this for TikTok. And I'm sure she'll see <laughs> exactly. It. Great. Yeah. yeah. You give role model vibes. You guys would probably get along real well. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess so. I think that broke up. Uh, yeah. Oh, shit, really? yeah, yeah. I'm sorry you guys oh. had to find out this way. Wait, T, oh. how do you know? That's I'm, a, I'm on the internet, dude. Is it on the internet? Yeah, no up. way. Yeah, dude. Oh, no yeah. way. I thought they were going the distance. Damn, me too. They did that. Uh, what they do? They did that photo shoot together. Yeah. Can yeah. we turn this into a drama podcast? Yeah. <laughs> yes, dude. This is Tito. <laughs> They're split. Yeah, Splitsville. Shit, so, that hurts. Yeah. Are you don't like raise your hand or no. what's the deal? No, no, no. I'm, I'm only. I, I love her in business. I love her. And I, <laughs> I love, love her through my screen. I love. No, love I just, her on the I, internet. I appreciate Emma Chamberlain so much. I appreciate what she's done. You don't um, want your heroes to be ruined. Yeah, she's just she's an she's an icon to me. Like it's just just I, preserve her where you found I her. I look up to Emma Chamberlain. I love her. She's great. She's so good. Damn. Yeah, yeah, See? yeah. Damn, I'm gonna be thinking about that all day. I didn't know they broke up. Yeah, dude. I'm gonna do some research. It's gonna hit you. It's yeah. gonna hit hard. It's gonna be a hard <laughs> lunch for you. Yeah. you know, also, like ten out of ten, she slides into your DMs. Like ten out of ten. I, it's my hero. It, to me, she's Bruce Springsteen. You know, damn. If Bruce Springsteen, <laughs> that's a huge fucking statement. What are you saying? Are you on one? <laughs> Am I on one? Yeah. Like, Everybody has different you? heroes. You don't criticize him. Yeah. Okay, you're right, you're right. I love Bruce. Sorry. I love Emma Chamberlain. They're equal. Uh, they're equal. I love the crucifix. I love everything. Jesus. Yeah, I don't know. So Jesus on the cross, equal to Emma Chamberlain's vlogs. Yeah. Yeah, man. They were great. Piggy's waiting for you. It's all waiting for you. It's all I, waiting for you. I do have one more question. Yeah. Do you think about when the boot comes off, you're going to have one clean shoe and one dirty shoe? <laughs> Dude, yes. Yeah. I was just staring at that. And, and I, I had like, to buy multiple pairs of shoes because my heel hurts so bad. Yeah, everything's going to be so weird. It's, cause it's. I don't know. I'm not looking forward to it. You're just going to keep the boot on forever now. Yeah, like stinky cast boy. Yeah, <laughs> I, might, I might just do that. But yeah. You're a good one, Peter McPoland. <laughs> Thank you, Zach Sang. You are too. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad I could do it. Oh, yeah. Sorry we're not Emma Chamberlain, but... It's okay, man. Or Mr. Beast. Or who's he on? Uh, Rhett and Link are up there. Rhett and Link. Uh, you like, guys are kind of uh, close to Rhett and Link. Damn. You got the, Well, you got the, the double thing going. There's two of you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah look at us. We're the new Rhett and Link. Not has at all. <laughs> has anyone ever commented on the gap between that desk and this chair? Yeah, almost everybody. All right. I'm just yeah, sure. but in like two or three weeks, we're moving to a new studio, and the gap will be a little smaller. All right. That's cool. But you do, does it feel far away right now? Um. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Dude. But people on camera also can't see the mess under this table that you can see right now. That's true. Oh my God, you guys would not believe what there's just <laughs> just it's no, like empty it's food bags. Shit everywhere. And Isn't it wild? And, we work in this amazing facility, crazy facility, and then you come into our studio and it's a shithole. It's that's the way a studio is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a shithole. Yeah. Thanks for understanding us. I got you. I got I, you, Zach. Saying. You should knock on that log. I do. Like, I'm getting good Emma Chamberlain vibes from. from oh, me. knock on the log. Yeah, just for good. It's, it's oh, a sure. lucky piece of wood. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Maybe her and Bruce Springsteen will DM me at the same time in a group chat. Honestly, if that <laughs> happens, I light myself on fire. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Cool. Sick. Peter McPoland, everybody. Woo! Thanks for having me. Thank you. 